good day from Washington, D.C., and I'd like to extend a warm welcome from the Africa Center to our over 300 alumni, friends, and distinguished, very distinguished colleagues from 56 countries that have registered for today's webinar entitled Taking Stock of African Peace Operations, a Multinational Joint Task Force. My name is Dr. Nate Allen, and I am the Assistant Professor of Security Studies here at the Africa Center. I'm the Africa Center's faculty lead on peace operations. This webinar is the third in a series of quarterly webinars we will be hosting to discuss strategic successes, challenges, and lessons learned for the African regional peace and security architecture from African Union authorized regional missions. Before we continue with the webinar, it's my honor to introduce the Africa Center Director, Kate Almquist Knopf, to say a few words of introduction. Kate, over to you. Well, thank you, Nate, and good day uh, to all of the colleagues who are joining us online. Uh, welcome uh, once again to the Africa Center's alumni, uh, to our distinguished colleagues, and to, to our friends uh, for joining the program today. The Africa Center serves as a forum for research, academic programs, and the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. We are a Department of Defense Regional Center located at the National Defense University in Washington, DC. And we carry out our mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. Accordingly, we seek to generate relevant insight and analysis that informs practitioners and policymakers on topical and emerging security trends and on effective responses to complex and dynamic security challenges. And recognizing that addressing serious challenges can only come about through candid and thoughtful exchanges, the Africa Center provides opportunities for partners to exchange views on shared interests and sound practices. And by engaging together, military and civilian, governmental and civil society, as well as national and regional, we hope to reinforce that we all have valuable roles to play in mitigating the complex drivers of conflict and insecurity on the continent today through enduring and capable institutions. This kind of dialogue infused with real world experience and fresh analysis, we hope provides an opportunity for continued learning and catalyzes concrete actions. And so these are our goals uh, for this webinar uh, and discussion today on the multinational joint task force in the Lake Chad Basin. Uh, thank you in advance uh, to our uh, wonderful panel uh, that we have lined up here. Uh, and uh, back to you, Nate, to, to take us into our discussion. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you very much, Kate. I'm gonna to try to keep my introductory remarks brief because we have a really excellent, distinguished, experienced panel and participants. Um, so this is the third in a series of webinars we're hosting to, uh, on, on types of peace operations that are known as African Union authorized ad hoc regional security initiatives. They're coalitions of regional actors that have come together to respond to shared security challenges and threats. They have each requested and received authorization from the African Union for their operations, but they operate outside the official framework of both the regional economic communities and regional mechanisms such as the African Standby Force. They're medium-sized peace operations as far as peace operations go, typically consisting of between five and 10,000 troops. Um, there are three such operations. Um, first, there is the G5 Sahel Joint Task Force, which we discussed at a webinar back in April. Uh, next, there is the African Union-led Regional Task Force to counter the Lord's Resistance Army, which we will discuss in the next uh, webinar series in a couple of months. And finally, there's the Lake Chad Basin's Multinational Joint Task Force, which will be the topic of our discussion today. The Multinational Joint Task Force, or the MNJTF, is an effort by the four Lake Chad Basin countries, Nigeria, Chad, Niger, and, and Cameroon, to cooperate, coordinate, and pool resources to contain the threat posed by the Boko Haram insurgents. The MNJTF in its current form was authorized by the African Union back in March 2015 and contains around 8,000 troops from the countries and the regions. These troops are intended to share intelligence, coordinate, and conduct joint operations to prevent the cross-border spread uh, of, of, of insurgents. Um, the sub-regional body that is charged with overseeing the MNJTF is the Lake Chad Basin Commission an organization that was initially created in 1964 to manage water resources, but has evolved in recent years to focus more on managing crises and insecurity. If you'd like to learn more, I strongly encourage you to check out the readings on our website for the program. Uh, so the main 
aim for today's webinar is to discuss the strategic successes, challenges that the MNJTF has faced confronting the insurgency in the Lake Chad Basin, and to consider lessons learned and recommendations to inform the broader peace and security architecture. And we have a really excellent and deeply experienced group of panelists with us today. Um, so I'd like to devote as much, as much time as I can to them. So without further ado, I'll keep my introductions brief. We have first a General Salabala, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the White Ink Consult, a private defense and security research, strategic communications, and training consultancy based in Abuja, Nigeria. He's a regular with us here at the Africa Center and has a history of distinguished service in the Nigerian military, including service as military chief of staff for the United Nations operations uh, in Cote d'Ivoire between 2011 and 2012. Uh, next, we have Dr. Dorina Pico, who is a research staff member with the Africa program at the Institute for Defense Analysis and also uh, well known to us at the Africa Center. She was the Associate Professor of Conflict Prevention, Mitigation and Resolution at the Africa Center here, and we're delighted to welcome her back today for today's program. Um, third, we have Dr. Rabaji Hoinathi, who is a senior researcher at the Institute for Security Studies, where he contributes to the Institute's work on violent extremism, conflict, and security governance in Lake Chai Basin. Previously, he headed the Centre de Recherche en Anthropologie et Sciences Humaines in Ninjamina, Chad. He has another, uh, he'll, he'll be at, he will be with us until about 9 and 9 uh, p.m. and for about an hour in today's conversation. Um, finally, we have joining us as a discussant, Dr. Dan Izinga, who is a research fellow here at the Africa Center, where he conducts policy research on Africa's most pressing security challenges. And his research uh, focuses on countering violent extremism and civil military relations uh, in the Sahel. We're delighted to have you. Really good to have you, Dan, as well. Looking forward to your insight. Um, so thanks to all of you for joining us. And we're going to begin with you, Ramajji, to, to help us understand the MNJTF successes and challenges from a civilian perspective before moving to General Bala, who will give us sort of the military standpoint. And then finally, we're going to conclude with Darina to give us a broad perspective on how the MNJTF compares to other kinds of peace operations and discuss some peace lessons learned. And then we'll conclude with, with Dan to offer his insights and, and kind of sum up the, the conversation before moving on to Q&A. So, Ramanji, uh, I'd like you to help our audience understand in a bit greater detail the political and strategic context surrounding the establishment of a multinational joint task force. How did the MNJTF come into being and who were the key actors involved in its creation? What are the MNJTF's main strategic objectives? Thank you for this opportunity to discuss with all the participants and the other colleagues. Uh, I will base uh, my discussion on the work of the LTBC in terms of the context of the multinational joint task force it's important to remember the context that led to uh the commission the lake chad basin Con commission in this region in we this region shares um several uh challenges the challenges of governance, of development, and also security challenges have arisen. Uh, the area, Nigeria, Cameroon, Niger, share this region. These have often been war zones. And with colonization, the colonization, post colonization uh, did not really change the situation. The insecurities simply changed. These are areas that are not always controlled by the state. There are rebellions, there are civil disturbances in this area of Lake Chad, and also arms that are in the area. And we have, therefore, we must also manage the waters. We share the waters of Lake Chad and its resources, as well as have a sub-regional collaboration to ensure peace and security. And in March 2014, before Boko Haram, 
we put together the multinational force to fight against transnational crime for these transnational criminal groups. So this force will be very operational on, on the field. We'll have to wait. Once Boko Haram uh, became a worrisome force, uh, especially became a, a, a regional threat, the mandate of this force had to be broadened in this fight against Boko Haram. Um, so the force was renamed uh, the Multinational Joint Force Against Boko Haram. Now, the force in its current um, a setting is marked by the crystallization of, of a threat that has become regional, Boko Haram, as well as the other security threats within the area. It is There is also a context that shows a, a, a sub-regional cooperation um, in the field and, and among the interpreter. I apologize if she cannot hear the speaker anymore. Hopefully we'll be able to, to come back and, and ha have you hear Mirage's take on uh, the MNJTF and, and to share his perspective on his contributions to the fight against Lake Chad Basin. Given that he's just dropped, I'd like to go to, to General Salva Bala to, to maybe fill in a little bit what, uh, and build on, on, on uh, Mirage's remarks. So General Bala, I'd like you, if you, if you might uh, talk about um, um, what your perspective is on the MNJTF as a military officer, if you could maybe describe, um, first of all, the MNJTF's basic strategic objectives, um, and maybe in addition to its basic strategic objectives, what 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 it's been like over the, the five years of its existence. What have been the MNJTF's key successes and challenges since it was authorized in 2015, mainly to contain the threat from Boko Haram after, as Ramaji was saying, sort of being standard previously to kind of combat transnational organized crime. And, and in your view, what factors explain some of these successes and inform the challenges? So if you could just give us a brief overview of the objectives and, and some of the, the history of, of, of the MNJT, if you will, and, and its successes and challenges. General Bala, why don't you, why don't you jump in and we'll, we'll, we'll go back to Ramanshi if he's able to, to join us again. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ned. Um, it is by some divine faith that uh, this has happened. Uh, because I was just going to, in my opening, explain that it will be very difficult to explain the military objectives at the strategic level without touching on the, on the political objectives. And I'm also pleased that my colleague, uh, 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 the, uh, the commanding general of MNJTF, is on board, so he will be able to fully, really uh, speak on, on, on current issues. And uh, if there are any uh, 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 clarifications he might make, of certain uh, facts or arguments that I may put up, it will really be very, very rich. Uh, thank you very much. In the first place, uh, it is important to keep in mind the reality that the MNJTF is a peace enforcement and not a peacekeeping force in the classical sense. There was never peace to be kept before its inception and since ever. The MNJTF is an offensive and stabilization mechanism with the objective of combating Boko Haram and other terrorist insurgent groups operating around the Lake Chad Basin. Um, its establishment under its current structure was determined by the LCBC heads of state and government during the extraordinary summit of the LCBC member states and Benin in Niamey, uh, Niger on 7 October 2014. Uh, and on 25th November 2014, the African Union Peace and Security Council fully endorsed its uh, uh, activation. It is a force with a multinational joint headquarters in, M in Jamena uh, and is operationally deployed in four sectors, sector one Cameroon at Mora with headquarters at Mora, sector two in Chad at Bagasola, sector three in Nigeria, Mongunu, sector four in Niger, Difa. It is important to re recap the uh, political objective of the L L LCBC uh, administered by the L LC, uh, 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 administ uh, administered by the LCBC in order to understand the MAJTF uh, mandate. The uh, LCBC mandate and strategy as sanctioned by the Africa Union as a regional strategy is framed on three pillars, which are stabilization, recovery, and resilience. This is captured elaborately in the Africa Union regional strategy for the stabilization 
recovery and resilience of the Boko Haram affected areas of Lake Chad region introduced only recently in August 2018. But it's not to say that uh, these issues were not since uh, 2014, but it is only that the uh, original strategy itself was enunciated in 2018. The, uh, the mandate of the MNJTF is to create and facilitate the implementation of comprehensive stabilization programs by the LCBC in affected areas, assist in restoring state authority to them and return displaced persons to their homes. Uh, its mandate further includes conducting military operations to prevent the expansion of Boko Haram and other group uh, activities, conducting patrols, preventing all transfers of weapons or logistics to the group, actively searching for and freeing all abductees, including the girls kidnapped, the Chibok girls, carrying out PSYOP operations to discourage defection within Boko Haram ranks. And uh, it is also taxed to undertake specific actions in areas of intelligence, human rights, information, and the media. Recognizing the complexity of its mission, three components, military, police, and civilian, were to be established. It is unclear if the important police component for law enforcement has been given any attention by member states. Events do show that the first patrol by elements of sector one located on Cameroonian soil took place in November, 2015. The force only truly swung into action at the beginning of 2016. It was from February, 2016 onwards that the first large scale operations were carried out by MNGTF troops or with their uh, or with their participation uh, 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 their past participation in member nations uh, operations there are also been at least four large scale military operations by the mngtf alongside the national units of the relevant countries from 14 uh, 11 to 14 february 2016 in the nigerian town of ngoshi as part of operation arrow 5 on 20 february 2016 in the time of kumushi in Nigeria, near the Cameroonian border, considered to be a support base for Boko Haram. On 16th March, 2016, in the Cameroonian and Nigerian uh, uh, localities of, of Njibrili and Zamga, within the framework of Operation Tanta Cure. On 10th and 16th May, 2016, in the Madawiya forest in Nigeria, in a joint action conducted by troops from the MNJTF Sector 1 and soldiers from the Cameroonian Operation Emergence 4, supported by the Nigerian Army. The major operations again are Gamma, uh, Gamma Aiki 1, Gamma Aiki 2, Amina Faka uh, 2018, Yenchin Tafki in 2019. Then there are other operations like Operation Obdehin Kai, uh, MNGETF Sector 3, Civil Military Relations uh, with NGOs and Medical Outreach. It is important to clarify that Amnifaka and Yenchin Chavki were Chadian planned and executed operations along the Lake Chad area and shores due to its work presence and offensives from islets on the lake and from Nigerian frontiers. Operation Wrath of Bohoma, meanwhile, is the massive offensive by Chad as a response to a well-coordinated and resourced ISWAP offensive that resulted in the killing of an estimated 90 troops at the Bahoma camp on 23rd March, 2020. The operation was personally led by the late Marshal uh, Idris Dabi Itno, the late president of uh, Chad. All the Chadian operations are the ones known to have tested the right of pursuit policy of the MNJTF CONOPS. Operations Amnifaka was funded by Nigerian government. The participation of MNJTF troops from Niger, Nigeria, and Cameroon were nominal in, in each of the cases. While these operations are within the defined MNJTF territory, the nuanced freedom and authority of command by the commander of MNJTF under the political direction of the executive secretary LSBC is weak and non-existent because the troop contributing countries maintain both command and administrative and political control of their forces and resources available to their units from their own national commands and political structures. The commander MNJTF mainly plays a coordination role. Uh, MNJTF neither has its own combat and combat support and combat logistics support units and resources. MNJTF depends on member nations assets to carry out their operations as much as the French and US support Chad 
with air and intelligence resources, as well as logistic support for their operation. The US has a clear no intelligence sharing policy with Nigeria for reasons that the sanctity of the intelligence shared with Nigeria cannot be guaranteed. The policy extends to the MNGTF because of the Nigerian presence in the coalition. This is in spite of Nigeria being at the heart of the insurgency and with the most forces. The AU in 2019 specifically also denied the MNGTF funding to set up and operationalize its own intelligence gathering mechanism. It is regrettable that in spite of the place of Islamist insurgency across the Sahel, that there is no relationship of the MNGTF with the G5 Sahel and even the winding down French operation Barkhane that is transforming into a wider European operation, Takuba, under the European Union new strategy with Africa. Specifically, it is important to recall the peace and security component of the Africa Peace Fund of the EU that has given way to a new instrument called the European Peace Facility, adopted by the European Union Council in March 2021. The EPF is a new funding modality with broad scope that goes beyond supporting the AU peace and security initiatives and allows direct support to regional and national efforts. The EPF will have a chapter, uh, a capacity of 5 billion euros for the period 2021 to 2027. Some of its critics, however, allude that the EPF dilutes the AU's strategic coordination and oversight role in matters of peace and security and reduces the institutional support to the AU Commission. Because of the bilateral support to individual nations clause in the new EU strategy of engagement in Africa, one wonders how this will impact on MNGTF capacitation, since even when funding were channeled through AU, there were problems. And if on bilateral basis, some EU policies that are aligned to US ones discriminate against particular nations and therefore antithetical to the conops of the MNGTF, where strength of the coalition is framed on the ability of member nations to fight to secure their territories from within themselves by themselves. The contribution of the European Union to enhance information operations of the MNGTF is however evidenced through the fulfillment of its pledge to provide additional support to enhance the operational efficiency of the MNGTF by providing command, control, communication, and information systems to the force. Uh, meanwhile, the MNGTF is pivotal to the fundamental political and development pillars of the stabilization, re uh, recovery and resilience strategy and mandate of all the national and developmental partnership of the effort at the Lake Chad Basin. The AU regional strategy in its nine point agenda never made any note of, and even as far as to make budgetary considerations for the important peace enforcement force which is a peace enforcement mandate to stabilize the region to allow for easy implementation of the three legs of the strategy. I will not bother to, to state the nine uh, 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 pillars. Um, but all these are in spite of the tasks considered for the MNJTF in a civil military cooperation effort in the strategy for the force to support LCBC in the delivery of humanitarian assistance, restoration of law and order, and basic public services and the resumption of development uh, processes, which are all contingent upon the continued success of military operations to ensure the necessity, security, and conditions. The strategy also emphasizes that civil military relations is part of the MNJTF mandate, yet does not provide for resourcing uh, it. Specifically, if one will enumerate the challenges. The challenges is that, the threat from the terrorist insurgent, uh, insurgents remains cr very credible. Attacks at Baga, the former MNGTF headquarters, several attacks at Difa, including the recent one which the insurgents did welcome the new commander to, to Difa is a point to, uh, of concern. And the credible uh, effort we have seen at uh, the attack on Boma, Bahama Khan. Others are lack of central political direction, even from the LCBC political structure, and looming images of the Chadian political leadership and its better equipped and less risk averse forces, while the other members remain within their territories. There is lack uh, of command. General Bala, can, yes. I, can I jump, jump in real quick? So you've given a really, really comprehensive overview of the MNJTF and its operations. 
Yeah. And I think, I think I'd like to maybe take things over to Darina a little bit to talk a little bit more about the MNJTF as a, as a peace operation. Then we can come back around, especially since General Maji came off and have everybody give a little bit more of their perspective on the, on the challenges and, and lessons learned. So, so thank you very, very much for, for those remarks. But I think, I think we should go over to, to Darina. Um, uh, so Darina, I, uh, so th th thank you very, very much. So, so Darina, um, so we've had a really comprehensive overview from General Bala about the MNJDF starting in 2014, some of its major uh, operations um, as, as, a, as an entity to kind of uh, coordinate cross-border military operations, how, um, you know, it's, it's the, the MNJTF commander is not only not in control, it's really the regional militaries that are in charge of operations. And, you know, I'd like to go back to something he said at the beginning, which is that, that, that you know, this is a peace enforcement operation, not necessarily a peacekeeping operation, which I think understand it in peacekeeping parlance is actually a fairly significant distinction. So I'd like to kick it over to you a little bit to maybe discuss from us how we understand uh, the MNJTF as a peace operation and kind of what role that regional actors like the African Union and the Lake Chad Basin Commission played in the uh, creation of the MNJTF. How, how does the MNJTF as an ad hoc regional arrangement, as it's called, compare to other kinds of peace operations? So if you answer that, then I'm gonna go around to each one of you again and give, get your insight on some of the main challenges and, and recommendations for lessons learned. Um, yes, thank you uh, very much uh, for inviting me to, to join the, the panel. Um, I want to start first by um, just going back to how you introduced um, the the topic, um, Nate. That you know the MNJTF was, I'm sorry, the Lake Chad Basin was formed in 1960 to address you know environmental organ issues. Um, the MNJTF was also formed much earlier than than 2015. I actually formed in 1994 to address criminality. And I bring the, that up because much like the regional economic um, uh, community organizations that we now see, um, you know, launching military interventions. The um, Lake Chad Basin and the MNGTF were formed for purposes that are much um, different than what they are um, doing today. And what that means is that they are still, the, the institutions around um, the peace support operations or peacekeeping or peace enforce, enforcement are not there. So much like um, ECOWAS, which is the, the, um, the regional economic organization that is most advanced in um, um, peacekeeping uh, on the continent, uh, those institutions have to be formed at the Lake Chad Basin and the MNGTF. Um, and so that becomes important when you think about, uh, you know, what are the processes and what are the protocols that are governing um, peace support um, operations. One key difference between something like the MNJTF and the other ad hoc um, peacekeeping operations is that they did not um, launch with some level of regional consensus. So, you know, while you might not have, you know, all countries agreeing, you know, at the rec level to you know, take a particular action, not agreeing at the same intensity. Uh, ECOWAS, for example, must take those actions with a consensus. And that has kind of manifested in the MNJTF's operations in some of the, um, or rather exacerbated some of the distrust that we have seen over the years between um, the countries that um, make up the, the contribute troops, in particular between Nigeria and Cameroon, Nigeria and and uh, and Chad, um, and that has also affected how it's uh, gone about accomplishing its mission. So th those are key um, key differences between a peace operation that might be you know, um, endorsed um, by regional economic community versus um, some of these, um, some of the ad hoc, um, ad hoc uh, peace, peace operations. Um, the MNJTF is also unique in that it kind of straddles two regions, in this case, ECOWAS and the Economic Community of Central African States, ECAS. 
And so the, um, you know, the sort of hegemon or the lead um, countries in those two regions uh, might not always, always be on the same page. And we kind of see that, um, we've seen that over the years um, impact uh, the, the, um, the MNJTF. Some of the um, challenges, or rather some of the, the questions that I, I, I think the, um, an ad hoc um, peacekeeping operation like, like the MNGTF raises are, you know, if you, if you form outside of um, a REC, and here I'm going to use ECOWAS um, just because it is the, the more advanced of, of the, the RECs in, in this regard, what might be missing? Um, one of the, the um, key things that's missing is that there's, there's no established peace and security protocol, which ECOWAS has had and has been, and has been refining um, over the years. And so the peace and security protocol um, has designated certain institutions and certain um, procedures uh, dictating um, diplomatic intervention, dictating, not dictating, but um, outlining diplomatic intervention, when that might take place, um, how military interventions might take place, which um, entities might, um, might, be, might be involved. And that is missing um, in, in an ad hoc um, um, construction. Some of the questions that um, are raised uh, when we um, consider the MNJTF is the role of the regional hegemon. In this case, it's, it's Nigeria. Um, and as the regional hegemon, it has some control over the, its conflict narrative. So um, wh whereas um, a regional economic community like ECOWAS might have been able to you know, call attention or you know, have a discussion at the regional level of a security um, issue that's happening you know, among its member states, um, it was not able to do that with um, with the sort of the the regional hegemon suffering the insecurity. So I think that that um, that is uh, that's that's something that um, that that we see. Um, there are also um, concerns about what this means for the principle of subsidiarity, which has been governing um, the African um, peace and security architecture. Should there be a rethinking of what subsidiarity um, means? So uh, I just wanted to raise some of these um, questions that, that kind of pop up when we you know, look at the, the ad hoc um, peace and security uh, operations. No, well, thank you very, very much. I think you highlighted how, you know, perhaps above all, the MNJTF and these other ad hoc regional arrangements are really a challenge to some of the, the flaws in the regional security architecture, and that there are often conflicts that span different regional economic communities. Um, you know, they're not, these aren't really just the, the type of conflict we see in, in Africa right now, by and large, isn't traditional peacekeeping. And to some degree, we've seen the emergence of these ad hoc regional arrangements come directly in response to that. So I want to do one more round of questions. We're already running a little bit low on time. So please, if you could keep your remarks to two or three minutes so that we have time to bring to bring Dan in. But I'm going to ask each of you in various ways to talk about what you see as um, some of the, the success challenges or, or recommendations for reforming the, the peacekeeping architecture based on the MNJTF experience. So let's bring you in, Ramanji. I, I see you've, you've joined us back. Maybe you might want to keep your, your video off in case we lose you again but we really want to hear uh, your point of view. So um, in, in your view, Ramajdi, how, how effective has the MNJTF been in containing Boko Haram? Okay, uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, I apologize once again for my uh, internet connection problems. As the general Salabala explained earlier, we the um, the uh, multinational force has undertaken several missions on in the region and in 
different countries. We have undertaken various operations. And the fighting does continue. And the uh, insurgents continue to be resilient. So we have to admit we have had some success in this uh, asymmetric warfare, but we do need to improve the security situation in the area of Lake Chad Basin. The neutralization of, of some of the members of Boko Haram after the operations we've undertaken sometimes the that we have been able to this is very important we have been able to live uh, release have a number of hostages released and this is very important and uh, we have been able to um, do so so it's very clear that even if on in the field we have had setbacks we have also had some success. It's also important to mention that today the armies that are engaged in the area to fight the terrorists, such as Boko Haram, to fight the insurgents and terrorists, I think the 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 we are able to the MNJTF is able to do this, and we will speak of the different challenges, and we have spoken of different challenges, but this group, as I said, has in spite of the issues we are. In spite of the difficulties that they are having with their leadership, they are able to renew themselves, the insurgents. Uh, they are able to evolve. And so we need to uh, we need to be able to address this and keep up with that. General Bala was also speaking of the um, one of the major challenges of the MNJTF in terms of security, the interpreter has lost the sound from the speaker. The interpreter no longer can hear the speaker. Ah. So it is important in this kind of warfare to Today, it's important to capitalize on the capabilities of the MNJTF. It's important to have consistency and cooperation. If not, uh, the grounds that we gain can be easily lost. And, and this has uh, been shown to be the case. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. So I think you've highlighted how the MNJTF has had a, a mixed record, you know, in terms of being pretty successful in containing uh, Boko Haram at times, particularly go back to early 2015 when it seemed like the threat was at its worst and, and the regional cooperation, I think, was critical in, in turning back the threat, but sort of has been inconsistent, I think, in its ability to sustain pressure and completely contain Boko Haram. So that's really nice insight. Um, so General Bala, I think I think given given uh, Ramaji's comments there, I'd, I'd like to know from you, um, what do you think needs to be done to ensure that, that MNJTF military operations uh, continue or, or durably contribute to stabilization efforts in the Lake Chad Basin? Again, you take about three minutes. Uh, you're muted. Uh, General Bala, could you unmute yourself? Uh, apologies again. Uh, the solutions are inherent on diplomatic confidence building among the LCBC member states and their management of their privileged international partners' bilateral opportunities for the benefit of all. 
All this is to the understanding that the M and JTF mechanism to peace and stability around the Lake Chad Basin is for the good of the overarching security and stability of all the states and safety of their people, and indeed for the original reason of the establishment of the LCBCA mechanism, which is about the management and equitable use of the lake, the land around it, its resources, and the development of the region and the provision of safety and security of its people. That said, it will be important to address the following issues which were raised in my earlier discussions on the challenges. That there should be better coordin uh, coordinated political control and direction for the MNJTF by the leadership of member states in strengthening political control of the force by the executive secretary and head of mission of the LCBC. There should be better commitment for funding mechanism to resource the forces operations which will lessen the burden on member states who themselves are strapped with internal crisis and development pressures. At present, most of the funding is done by Nigeria. In spite of opportunities like in the EU new partnership strategy, new funding mechanism, the AU should continue to act as the hub for fundraising and also policy monitoring and evaluation on implementation of observance of, inter observance of international best practice by the force through its peace and uh, security uh, council. The force will need its own dedicated combat and combat support and combat logistic assets and intelligence resources for freedom of planning and execution of operations. The level of force needs to be upscaled aside the kinetic operations necessities, but more because of the rising humanitarian operations occasioned by the massive surrender of former Boko Haram fighters and movement of internally displaced persons from liberated or abandoned areas and the need to protect civilians. The force commander should be given more command authority over the sector commands than the token coordination role he has. The strategic and operational level of MNJTF leadership needs to be tenured, like in the UN peacekeeping missions and not like in the current dispensation, where the posting and deployment of commander and MNJTF and sector commanders are on the initiative and whims of the nations. Since its inception, for example, uh, the force has had seven commanders. The last one before uh, the current commander having, on, having been on the seat for less than six months. And then international partners need to be more realistic and non-discriminatory in their relationship with member states on how their interests play out while lending support to some and excluding other members of the coalition. Lastly, the force should have a strategic link to all other military mechanisms within the Sahel, being the G5 Sahel, Operation Barken that is transforming into uh, Operation Takuba, and any other UN support frame, uh, military framework. Uh, thank you. Thank you, General Ball. I think that's a really excellent uh, concrete set of recommendations. And one thing that struck me is I think essentially the recommendation is, is to make the MNCHTF a little bit more resemble a traditional peace operation in terms of having command authority, more consolidated around the LCBC commissioner, have the AU more in control over uh, funding um, and external support more channeled through uh, the AU. So it's a very interesting set of recommendations and I think a perfect opportunity for uh, Darina to comment on what, what do you think, so as a peacekeeping expert here, what do you think are the, the broader lessons learned from the MNJTF uh, regarding peace operations more broadly? Do you agree with General Obama? Do you think, uh, how, how can, how can um, uh, the MNJTF experience, or how can, how can other regional peace and security actors, the African Union, the RECs, uh, learn from the MNJTF experience or, or better integrate uh, uh, ad hoc regional coalitions into the broader peacekeeping architecture? What do you think African leaders need to do to make uh, these types of peace operations more effective? Thank you. Um, I, yes, I just want to highlight um, three lessons, essentially. Um, the first is that the regional economic communities, the RECs, uh, might not be flexible enough to address security issues, um, but they, they offer institutions that are um, important. So how do we, how do we integrate um, the ad hoc um, peace support operations into the RECs. So I think it's time to have kind of a rethinking about um, how instead of the ad hoc institutions being separate, how might they be integrated into the regional economic um, communities and their peace and security 
um, protocols so that the institutions that govern the peace and security protocols might also apply to the ad hoc arrangements um, because there, there are some benefits to that. Um, related to that, I think a second lesson is that um, maybe the principle of subsidiarity doesn't work when we are um, talking about a regional hegemon or a, a significant member state. Um, so how do we, um, again, how does the, 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 the REC um, learn from the ad hoc? So I think that there are some lessons that both organizations can give to each other um, because um, clearly we've got the ad hoc um, peace support operations popping up because the RECs and the institutions governing peace and security were not able to address the security um, threat. Um, and then finally, and this has come up um, I think, uh, with the other panelists, um, just to reinforce the um, reforms underway to secure funding for um, peace and support operations. Um, relying on um, a member state that is willing to fund um, um, an operation also brings in some of the problems we've seen with, with um, the ad hoc um, uh, arrangement. And so how does the African Union um, really um, fulfill its object objectives to have some level of independence uh, with um, the um, funding, financing of peace support operations? Thank you very, very much, Doreen. I think those are an excellent set of recommendations. Um, so now, Dan, it's finally time to, to bring you in as our discussant. Um, you know, you've been a really keen observer of efforts to manage conflict and confront terrorism in the broader West African region, especially kind of more contemporary era, uh, uh, efforts. So I'd love to hear your take on, on what struck you from today's remarks from our panelists. And so, Dan, after listening to our three experts, what do you think are the key lessons learned from the MNJTF on how to improve broader regional approaches to conflict management and stabilization? Uh, well, thank you, Nate, and, and thank you to uh, each of our esteemed panelists for some uh, not only comprehensive, but very uh, detailed and in-depth remarks uh, covering the MNJTF, its challenges, the, the, its development, its origins. Um, I, you know, uh, I'm going to struggle here to try and uh, provide some synthesis across the three panelists, uh, but three things jumped out at me as uh, sort of challenges and opportunities. And uh, the first is, is obviously coordination across the Lake Chad Basin region. Um, and so coordination across the member states, um, both as, as General Bala said many times, uh, politically and militarily. Um, it stood out quite clearly that uh, the MNJTF succeeds or fails uh, with its member countries. Um, so the success of the regional armed forces, whether they be Chadian armed forces, Nigerian armed forces, Nigerian or Cameroonian, uh, is also going to uh, help bolster uh, the objectives of the MNJTF. Um, similarly though, however, where you have coordination breakdowns uh, or uh, uh, perhaps competing priorities amongst those partner countries, um, that's, a, that's a weakness, I think, of the MNJTF uh, in that sense. Um, and so you have to figure out mechanisms for coordinating uh, amongst those countries to achieve shared goals uh, and to identify uh, a strategy that will be effective uh, across the region. Um, and I think that this gets at the second point that I drew out uh, from, from the remarks of our panelists, that uh, th there, because the ad hoc uh, security initiatives are, are ad hoc by nature, uh, because they are responding to evolving crises, uh, they lack uh, the institutional frameworks uh, that would help to provide that degree of coordination and to create uh, the strategic uh, planning and foresight for how to confront the different threats at a, in, a, in a concerted way. Um, so this can be something, uh, as Dorina pointed out uh, on a couple of occasions, as the, the lack of an established uh, uh, peace and security protocol across the MNJTF, um, the challenges then again of, of bringing in uh, regional, uh, different regional partners. So um, which, which protocol do you take? Do you take the, the longer, more established uh, protocol from ECOWAS? Uh, what kinds of impacts does that have for the states that are part of ECAS? Uh, and so you, then you get back into these competing rivalries, regional rivalries. 
Um, but it also is true for points that General Bala made and points that Ramaji made about uh, the degree of command and control for the MNHATF and how it coordinates with the military. There's a, a lack of transparency and uh, institutional process uh, for command and control within the MJTF, leading to things like uh, seven different commanders in a in, uh, period of, of what something like three or four years, I think General Bala said. Um, so without a tenure process or clear procedures, without the institutions that dictate how the command structures of the MNJTF are going to function, uh, it becomes much more complicated uh, to establish then the, the types of coordination that would lend itself to uh, sustaining uh, pressure on the insurgent threat. Um, and that, that brings me then to the sort of final point that I think is really important and, and comes out in our research at the Africa Center on militant Islamist groups in the Lake Chad Basin. And that's that the, the MNJTF is uh, at its core uh, a creation that was in response to a fast evolving situation, the emergence of Boko Haram uh, as, as a real threat in, in 2014. Um, and that situation has since changed quite a bit. And so that the conflict has evolved so rapidly um, that the MNJTF is having to respond to that as well. Uh, and so currently we see you know, new, a new perhaps tipping point in this conflict where with the death of Shikau, uh, you know, some of the momentum behind Islamic State West Africa and Boko Haram has been lost. Uh, there seem to be some internal squab squabbles within Islamic State West Africa. Uh, we've seen uh, more defections from Boko Haram uh, than, than in previous years, I think over 2,000 by some counts, by some of the work done by Ramaji and, and his colleagues at ISS. Um, and, and yet, despite these fluctuations, we still see that you know, fatalities linked to militant Islamist groups in the region remain comparable uh, to other theaters on the continent, such as the Sahel and Somalia. And so it underscores that you know, this militant Islamist activity in the theater is still highly fluid. Um, and, and that, I think, gets a, a, a larger challenge of the MNJTF, but perhaps an opportunity for it as well, in that uh, it is not only uh, an ad hoc regional actor bringing together these different forces, which ideally would have seamless coordination and communication across their efforts, um, but it's also presenting an opportunity to start to establish uh, some institutionalized knowledge about uh, variations in the theater itself. So, if we think about where the defections have been occurring most recently, it's primarily out of Sembiza Forest, Northeast Nigeria, and parts of Northern Cameroon. But the, the conflict there, the tactics, the strategies that need to be deployed there are going to vary quite a bit from tactics and strategies that are necessary to confront the threat that continues to be persistent uh, across the islands in Lake Chad, uh, where the context is quite different. And the MNJTF has the, the potential, I think, to function as a body that brings together that knowledge to help identify uh, what differences in tactics and strategies might be most effectively deployed. Um, I think about, for example, also, I think General Bala mentioned the Chadian operation, Bahamas Wrath, uh, after, the, uh, after the attack on uh, the Balma base uh, on Chadian forces. You know, that was a, 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 a Chadian-led effort and there, were some, there was some degree of effort that was uh, quite highly publicized that the Chadian forces made to coordinate with the MNJTF. I mean, that, that strikes me as an opportunity. I think it's probably unrealistic to think that in an operation like that, which is based on the Chadian forces' ability to quickly mobilize and pursue the threat, uh, that it, it's unrealistic to think that the Nigerian and Nigerian counterparts would be able to react as quickly and as coordinatedly uh, with the Chadian armed forces, but the MNJTF might be able to do something like that. And so there's an opportunity, I think, there that all of the, the regional member states might uh, have a shared goal of in creating a joint, joint MNJTF force uh, that would be able to react as that kind of partner. Um, and I think that this gets at sort of a fundamental question that remains uh, unseen and, and ties together sort of these three different challenges. And that's questions about the long-term uh, viability and, and, and the future of the MNJTF. Where does it go from here? As we see the, the conflict change and evolve, ideally, as we see uh, the, the prospects for peace and stabilization increase, you know, what does the MNJTF become? Uh, where, does it, where does it go to continue to confront this threat? And then as the threat changes, how does it adapt to that context? And 
I think that that's something that needs to be given a lot of thought now in order to ensure that it's effective in the future. Um, and that gets at things that Dorina brought up as well in terms of how do we how do we integrate this into the larger regional architecture? And I think those are really important questions to be considering today uh, so that we can uh, better resolve this conflict for the future. And uh, I think I'll, I'll leave my, my comments there for now and look forward to the question and answer. This is uh, a wonderful panel. So I'll take the opportunity to say thank you again. Thanks, Dan. I think that was a really wonderful summary and series of reactions. And you know, I think you raised both some fundamental uh, uh, successes that the MNJTF has had, particularly in spurring cross-border coordination to combat Boko Haram and contain the threat, as well as some of the fundamental challenges our panelists has raised surrounding how to better integrate the MNJTF both into what other ECOWAS and, and what other regional forces are doing, and into kind of a broader African peace and security architecture. Um, we have a, a very special guest who has joined us uh, today. We have the commander of the Multinational Joint Task Force currently on the chat line, as General Ball alluded to, Major General A.K. Ibrahim. And we have promoted him to panelist. And General Ibrahim, if you would, if you have any uh, questions, comments, or reactions, or would like to share anything uh, from your perspective as the commander of, of the Multinational Joint Task Force, um, we would love to hear your insight. So um, could we please, uh, I think you should be able to, you should be a point of panelist, you should be connected. So as you just, if you were able to unmute yourself and unmute your video, hopefully we're gonna be able to, to hear you. Uh, address the, the audience here. Can okay. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Nathaniel, for this great opportunity given to me. And uh, I appreciate uh, the previous speakers. I have had some new insights into uh, the multinational joint tax force. Uh, before I make my little comments, I want to specially recognize uh, Brigadier General Bala, who was my instructor at the military academy in Nigeria many years back. And uh, listening to him, I told myself, what will I contribute more? Because General Bala has virtually spoken most of the things uh, I would have loved to say. But uh, be that as it may, I just want to say that uh, we've had some uh, little upgrade from the last time General Bala uh, you know, took a look at the MNJTF. Uh, for example, uh, we do have intelligence from uh, uh, you know, the Americans and the, uh, the French. We have what we call the Center for Coordination and Liaison, CCL. Uh, they work along with us. When we have our briefings on Mondays, they come along and we share intelligence. And uh, I also, you know, I have been here just over a month. I visited Operation Bakan, the headquarters, where we held discussions with the commander, uh, Major General Micron. So I feel that uh, uh, some things have been uh, happening here that uh, maybe is not abreast with. Then I want to just make a quick correction on the issue of uh, operations Amni Fakat and Yankin Tapki. These are actually MNJTF led operations, but we had significant contributions by the Chadian forces and other forces. So we virtually work together, even uh, uh, Operation uh, Rat of Goma. Uh, there was significant MNJTF participation in the planning of that operation, and we supported with uh, logistics and other things. So I just want to say that, um, uh, like has been said, the uh, mandate of the MNJTF is to actually defeat Boko Haram, to restore normalcy in the Lake Chad Basin, to ensure the return of the IDPs, and also for humanitarian activities to take place. We have been doing that, but we could do better. And I agree with General Bala that uh, you know, the political leadership have to support us very well so that we can uh, uh, achieve some of these uh, uh, mandates. Uh, if you allow me, I will just uh, round up by saying that uh, uh, in June of this year, about 6,000 IDPs who fled the violence in uh, uh, Niger, you know, 
returned to the town of Barua, about 6,000 IDPs. And then just in August of this year, over 5,000 indigents of Kroskawa, of Baga, and Dorombaga, all in Kukawa local government areas within the Lake Chad Basin returned to their homes. This is mainly as a result of the work of the uh, MNJTF. But we have a long way to go, but uh, we'll take corrections and uh, hopefully maybe in the question and answer, somebody will ask me what are the challenges of the MNJTF? I'll be able to bring that. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, General. We're really delighted to have you with us. And again, we have from uh, a colleague in Nigeria. He wants to know how well the MNJTF has deployed technology in its operations, um, especially using satellite technology and uh, drones for uh, communication command and control in particular. And uh, likewise, um, what concrete kind of non-kinetic uh, programs or activities are being done in, in tandem with stabilization. So what I think the question is, what, what is the MNJTF doing to support more civilian-led uh, reconstruction efforts? So I guess that's really, really two questions, but they're two very, very good questions. Um, so why don't, we, why don't we start with those and, and hopefully we get a few more questions in, in the chat before we wrap up. Um, General Ballas, since this question is on technology and, and um, why, why don't we go to our, our military um, our, our military participants first who are probably going to be best position to comment specifically on the role of technology in, in MNJTF. So uh, General Ball and Major General uh, Ibrahim, if you also would like to comment, please feel free. I think I will concede this question particularly to General uh, Ibrahim, but uh, I will just touch a little bit on it. Uh, to recognize what I had said in my presentation of the support of the African Union to actually uh, activate the information, uh, the contribution of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, European Union to enhance information operations of the MNJTF, uh, which was evidenced in 2020 through the fulfillment of its pledge to provide additional support to enhance the operational, uh, the forces uh, operational efficiency by providing command control communication and information systems. There were also even evidences in, uh, on open source of, uh, uh, of training and uh, some level of uh, live operations that were conducted under the uh, immediate two past operational commanders in that uh, general uh, Yusuf. But I believe uh, General Ibrahim will be able to give more source to the operational, to the tactical realities. Thank you. Thank you, General Bala. General Ibrahim, so the role of, of technology in uh, the MNJTF operations, I think uh, it'd be great if you could fill us in there. Okay, thank you very much, sir, for this uh, opportunity. Um, maybe I, I forgot to mention that uh, we have some support that is uh, pending. Very soon, I think we should be able to have them from the European Union. And uh, this support uh, is a provision of intelligence, surveillance, and Reiki platforms, ISR, on a 24-hour basis under the command of the first commander. This is being projected, but uh, uh, we are told in the next two months or thereabout, we should have that. And if we have that, it will give us uh, uh, you know, uh, an edge, a technological edge, so to say, whereby we have eyes in the air that will enable us to track and uh, monitor the activities of the insurgents. Also, uh, uh, the issue of drones, we have some drones, but the drones we have are not high capability drones. Some of them at night, uh, we don't really get much from them. Again, the European Union has come in. Uh, we have been promised drones, uh, two per sector that has a capability of uh, between 20 to 30 kilometers and can operate both by day and night. So I believe uh, these are some of the uh, uh, basic things that are being done to ensure that uh, we have uh, uh, technology supporting our operations. And if I may add also part of the support from the European Union uh, they are going to set up naval outposts in every sector 
in each of the four sectors. And additionally, we are going to have uh, boats, about 14 boat, uh, 15 boats per sector. That is about 60 boats in all that will come into the MNJTF uh, inventory. And this is quite significant because we are talking about the Lake Chad. It means we'll be able to cover them by patrols and other forms of operations. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we've had a number of questions uh, that have been coming in. I will read them and then I will go around and give each of our panelists a one last opportunity to comment for unfortunately uh, concluding today's session. So a reminder, we still have a question about how the MNJTF is contributing to broader uh, 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 stabilization efforts in the Sahel that we have yet to ask. We have another similar series of questions. Um, first, on um, what strategy is the MNJTF putting in place with regards to rehabilitation and acceptance of victims into society? Um, also, what role do, do women play uh, since they're most vulnerable to conflict? And then um, uh, so we have another question kind of related on that. Um, it's good to have returnees in the Lake Chad Basin, but is it sustainable if we know that human security challenges are still huge and unaddressed? Is that trust is still lacking between the communities and the MNJTF? So I think we, it would be great to hear the panelists weigh in on the broader question of the degree to which the MNJTF is, is integrated into broader political approaches to address some of the underlying drivers of the conflict, the humanitarian response, which is, which is I think uh, was indicated by the general, is ostensibly part of the MNJTF mission. Um, what are the relationships like between the MNJTF and, and, and local communities? How is it aiding in both the civilian reconstruction effort and in reintegrating uh, defected members of Boko Haram, which is a huge question, as Dan mentioned, because we just had 6,000 plus members defect. So I think that's one really good series of questions to, 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 to answer if we could hear from our panelists. Um, and then the final uh, question, final two questions are one. Um, so one, one question is on the sustainability or sustainment of MNJTF funding. The, the G5 cell joint force has sort of a progressive sustainment content concept that's uh, attracting funding for the mission from, 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 uh, from those. Um, and, and is asking about, does the MNJTF have some kind of sustainment approach? How is the MNJTF funding uh, sustained? And how is it, I think, how is it going to be sustained, especially if it begins to look like a more formal uh, peacekeeping operation, I think is a really, really good question, given some of the uncertainties facing around broader kind of UN-sponsored uh, missions. And then finally, um, we have uh, one final question. Do you think... Do you think that the F, the, the multinational joint task force can have an approach where each uh, state has responsibility for a particular sector? Uh, would that be an approach? Okay, so let's just go through our panelists and, and, and hear their insights and, and, and final remarks. Um, Darina, why don't we, why don't we get you in? Uh, and when we get you in, then we'll go to Ramanji, then we'll go to Dan, and then we'll conclude with our two, uh, uh, General Bala and General Ibrahim. So, Andrea. Great, thanks. Um, I think I, I just want to focus on the, the question that was um, talking about the distrust um, between the, the countries. And I, and I think that is really important and goes to um, my earlier points about um, bringing the ad hoc arrangements into, uh, you know, under the umbrella of the regional economic communities and their peace and security protocols. I, I think that the distrust um, that persists is one of the um, um, the, the greatest negatives that, that we have with, with the ad hoc arrangements um, and um, just kind of bringing them under the, the umbrella of, of the, the existing peace and security protocols. So I'll, I'll leave it there because I know time is short, but I did want to, to comment on that question. Thank you, yeah, great point. Um, Ramaji, are you still with us? I, I thought you might have had to leave, but if you're still with us, feel free to weigh in on some of the questions that have been asked. Okay, finally. I will first react to the uh, first the question in French. That's about the sectors. So the issue of the sectors, for, for me, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, so to, to deploy, to specialize the sectors in relation to the countries, there can be an advantage because everybody knows their own region, their own terrain better. 
but the only way to make this effective is that you need to have effective collaboration, efficient collaboration, so that these sectors are, are not limited because you need to have pursuit operations, etc. So you have to establish these uh, cooperation mechanisms so that all, all of this is more efficient. The second question is the returned uh, people who go back to their regions to their place of origin we have really emphasized the issue of the protection of civilians and of course it is necessary at a certain point to to allow people to go back to their place of origin because that's the only way we can ensure that humanitarian aid is is resilient but we saw for example in Barwa that the population of the return, where they were the ones targeted by Boko Haram. So this attack, uh, you know, there was a strong response to this attack, but but the return of populations from their, to in their place of, of origin can only be accomplished if a civilian protection is, is established and, and is effective. And, and this, uh, so this is really part of, of everything that has to do with stabilization. That's, you know, the return of the state's authority within areas that were given up to, to the terrorists or to armed groups. So the two items go together. And, and so we must emphasize the, F, the, the uh, MNJTF's role, not only as a military tool, but also as a stabilization tool. So we really need to work on this in the field, because otherwise there's no point in bringing populations back. So this is very important. And the last item, sorry to, sorry to, to but to go further, the issue of the G5 Sahel. We have to be very careful about this issue. We, we spoke of, as, as of the, uh, MNJTF has a very special force as compared to the G5 Sahel because it has a more endogenous origin um, rather than, you know, the G5 Sahel, there was really an external um, uh, force for this uh, from, from France. So the, the difference is, is really, I, I think the states of the subregion, particularly Nigeria, have made tremendous efforts to really um, help uh, create this this force. But compared to other forces, the MNJTF is really the the poor uh, stepchild, and so we really need to to work on improving the situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dan. Over to you. Uh, thanks, Nate. Um, I, I will try to be very brief. Um, I want to make sure we provide time for our uniform colleagues. Um, I, I guess I, I want to keep my reaction uh, to this point about rehabilitation and moving to, to stabilization and the future of the MNJTF. I think it's probably the uh, most important uh, current challenge uh, facing, uh, facing the, the MNJTF is, is what comes next. And um, you know, there are some very well established precedents for, for stabilization. The protection of civilians is obviously key. Um, abiding by rule of law and human rights is incredibly important for rehabilitation of, of uh, former militants. And so as national governments begin that process of, uh, of rehabilitation, um, it's, it's essential that the, those processes are transparent, um, that they incorporate aspects of justice, um, and that ultimately they remain citizen centric uh, and, and, and are done in a humane way. Um, the MNJTF may have a role to play there, um, but I don't believe that, that, is, uh, that that's something that has been clarified up to this point. And this gets back to the challenge of not having uh, a strong institutional foundation for the organization. Um, and so laying out what frameworks it will develop and, and utilize in the future I think will be incredibly important as uh, as we begin to see that be uh, the next evolution uh, in the chapter of this conflict. Um, and so I think that that's something that needs to be given more thought. It may be a place where the African Union and the RECs have a strong role to play. Uh, they may be able to take lessons learned from previous conflicts in other areas um, and then recontextualize them for the Lake Chad Basin and, 
And so trying to tap some of that knowledge and that experience, I think might, uh, might be incredibly useful to the MNJTF uh, and its, uh, its regional members. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. So General Ball, if you could go for a minute or two, then I'd like to give the final word to uh, Major Ibrahim. I'll just uh, conclude the webinar. We're already over time, but I, I think it's important that he gets the last word. So General Ball, uh, go ahead. I think it is very, very important, like uh, Daniel really raised an important uh, question about the future of the MNJTF. Uh, I think the force is here to stay at the long term uh, because a counterinsurgency from us, the military, uh, we see it, we call it the long war. And uh, uh, a counterinsurgency indeed with a stabilization, resilience and recovery task is indeed a very long term, uh, has very long term implication. I mean, look at NATO. NATO started off as uh, a counterforce to the other uh, uh, to the other ideology. The other ideology is at a slump, and uh, uh, the bloc is at a, uh, it's in pieces and as a slump. But in spite in spite that NATO continues to uh, to be relevant, and this leads me to speak about the consistent of the political tool in the inter in international relations, and that. The diplomatic and economic instruments of state power are the major drivers of policy. So this is very, very important. And as we speak on the lecture basin, we find out that there are so many strategies out there that do not have a central coordinating hub, in spite of the AU and the LCBC itself. Uh, there are the nation, there are the national uh, uh, strategies, like for Nigeria, we have the uh, Buhari plan. For, uh, for, 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 for stabilization and rebuilding the Northeast region. You have the LCBC uh, 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 policy itself. You have the different international partners also having their own kind of strategy. You have the governors of the Lexiad Basin having their own perspectives. And um, these are all things that need to really be looked out in, 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 in an effort to handle this defection and other issues uh, with member states with their various kinds of, uh, of, 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 of strategies and policies and with MNGTF smack in the middle of it. But in the long term, I think we should keep our eyes on the, on the ball. For as much as I have said that the uh, kinetic, the, the military threat in that the insurgent threat is, is, uh, is resilient. But we must also continue to think about avoiding militarization of the region in the long term. I think this is very, very important. Like we see, NATO is present, but it is not in the face of, of the society. And this is the kind of uh, thinking that we should be having in the long term. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, all important points. Um, so uh, we are over time, but I think it's time to bring in General Ibrahim to conclude. We'd love to hear your concluding guidance, insight remarks. I think it's pretty clear from our, our panelists that you know, despite some of the challenges, the MNJTF has contributed a lot to peace and security in the Lake Chad Basin and probably will continue to contribute uh, into the indefinite future, in part because it's the efforts of, it's, it's, it's the sum total of the efforts of all the four regional uh, militaries and countries there. So uh, Major General uh, Ibrahim, um, please uh, please conclude the webinar with, with your thoughts and, and reactions and, and any, any clipping remarks you might like. Okay, thank you very much. Um, on the question about sectorization, if we can go across borders, the area of responsibility of the multinational joint tax force is actually the Lake Chad Basin areas, and it covers it. Uh, you know, it goes into uh, the countries of Nigeria, Cameroon, uh, Niger, and Chad. So we have the mandate; we can cross. It's not a problem. Then, uh, uh, on the issue of uh, if we coordinate with the humanitarian organizations, yes, we do. We understand that uh, we cannot say we are making progress if the local population is not taken care of. So we coordinate a lot with the uh, uh, with organizations like the United Nations Development Program, the local authorities. Recently, we had uh, medical outreaches in Mongono, Nigeria, in Bagasola, Chad, 
and also in Difa, in Niger, we had to coordinate with the humanitarian organizations and the local authorities before this was carried out, and it was quite successful. Uh, then on the issue of the surrounded uh, uh, Boko Haram terrorists, uh, presently the MNJTF has about 3,000 uh, uh, such uh, surrendees. Mind you, some of them are combatants, some of them are family members. Uh, but, uh, what we notice is that uh, uh, in the manner of uh, rehabilitation, uh, each country has its own uh, uh, way of doing it. And uh, I think that is something that should be looked into. Uh, you know, some of the countries feel there is no need to even have the surrendered uh, Boko Haram terrorists. So I think these are things that should be looked into. Uh, lastly, uh, it's a great privilege to be here and uh, hopefully we'll get more equipment, we'll get more capacity building and uh, there will be more political support to support the MNJTF. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, General, and thank you very much to all of our distinguished panelists for an excellent uh, webinar. Um, so please consider joining us for the next webinar in this series where we're gonna unpack the successes, challenges, and lessons learned from the African Union-led Regional Task Force to counter the Lord's Resistance Army. I hope that conversation is uh, a fraction as, as enlightening and interesting as this one has been. Um, but until then, I wish everyone a productive afternoon or evening from all of us here at the Africa Center.